Okay, so uh, I'm going to go through a bunch here. I, I was fortunate to, to go down and give a talk on the hemlock woolly adelgid work that we did in the Catskills uh, at a, a CRISP meeting a couple of years ago, and I'm going to bring some of that in, but I want to extend on, on uh, what we've done since then and, and kind of made some improvements on, on how we go about collecting uh, imagery and, and, and looking at these uh, data sets. So I have here on the initial slide a couple of things. I have hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, I'll talk about uh, emerald ash borer. And then I, I put down to the right there, that's uh, some southern pine beetle activity down in Long Island I'm not really going to talk about today, but we are, uh, we did make some, some southern pine beetle flights this year in Long Island, Rhode Island, and uh, Massachusetts. Uh, up here in the top right corner, you can see uh, kind of what I'm talking about if you were to, to visualize how we collect the data. I'm going to talk about scanning and profiling LIDAR, so you can see here what scanning would kind of look like a, a, if you think about a push broom, and then this profiling LIDAR, we like to describe that as sort of the, the, the um, rudder to our ship so we can kind of uh, lock into our position. And uh, with that, um, the, the folks that I've been working with, Bruce Cook, Larry Corp out of uh, NASA Goddard uh, Space Flight Center, Rich Hallett, Jen Pontius are, are uh, with Northern Research Station. Uh, Jen is also in a split appointment with uh, University of Vermont. All right. So uh, hyperspectral remote sensing has is, is really been the, the focus uh, of the, the past few years here, and it's used effectively to assess hemlock decline. We, we showed that with our 10-year our reassessment in the Catskills, uh, some ash decline work um, that uh, was done in, in Michigan, and we're looking at a, a data set down in Baltimore. Uh, we also have some, some data in the Catskills and, and now across uh, New England. Uh, G-Lite is, is what we have, have moved to, so the, the uh, image acquisition that we did in the Catskills, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that, but we've, we've started to use a, a, a different sensor and uh, uh, bringing in a, a concept called data fusion. And that brings this opportunity to increase accuracy and, and hopefully early detection. And, and oftentimes we talk about detection of insects and, and how, we, how we collect information. We like to throw out the term early detection. Uh, but uh, it, oftentimes, the, the early, how early it is, it, it might be something that's been there for quite a while. So we're always in search of that kind of holy grail of, of finding something right as it's starting to get going or, or the early onset of an incipient population. So data fusion, uh, really what we're looking at, you look out over to the right here, this, this box where there's sort of a hole in the ground in the, the top right, that's the G-Lite, and that stands for Goddard's uh, LIDAR Hyperspectral and Thermal Airborne Imaging System. So it's three imaging systems, and, and we're trying to fuse these data together. Uh, with that, you see this red box in the, uh, in the top left image there. That, that's a, a, a GPS that uh, allows us to essentially fix all of our, our image acquisitions or, or snap them to the same point or, or pixel. Uh, this plane that we're using, uh, it's a it's a um, smoke jumper uh, plane that we get a uh, Forest Service smoke jumper plane out of Redmond, Oregon. Uh, we've been flying our aerial surveys with it, and we've also been flying these these image collections with it, and, and working uh, with Forest Service Aviation and, and uh, NASA Aviation to to bring this relationship together. The the kind of beauty of of this imaging system is it's all off the shelf stuff. It's stuff that you could uh, essentially buy if you were to do some some uh, searching on on the web here to to put this whole thing together. So it makes it a lot more affordable than, than some of the, uh, the, the instruments that are out there right now. Another cool thing about what we're looking at here is, is uh, oftentimes you, you are looking at uh, remotely sensed information. It's, it's upwelling irradiance. So you're, you're looking at uh, the, 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 the sun's um, light being reflected off of uh, something and, and then brought back up. So we are collecting this upwelling in, uh, information, but we're also we we have a uh, a downwelling irradiance uh, sensor on the top of the the wing, so we're actually measuring both upwelling and downwelling, and it allows us to um, to fly in in some some conditions that were otherwise uh, you you couldn't fly before. So so bringing some clouds into the picture. Well, we're also flying now at at a thousand feet, uh, which is our our aerial survey. Um, collection height as well, so it's, it's uh, brought in some, some interesting opportunity to fly it at, uh, at the same level that we normally would fly at, just collecting uh, visual information. has a profiling and scanning LIDAR, as I said earlier, which kind of allows us then to, to collect two pieces of, of laser return information, one that allows us to get that, that uh, good fixed uh, altitude and elevation information, and then the other one that allows us to scan the landscape. 
it only weighs about 80 pounds too, so it's pretty easy to ship. Uh, we we pulled it out of the plane this year, and then they shipped it directly up to Alaska, and it's uh, it's very low uh, uh, low weight and easy to ship, and pretty low operational cost. So you used to hear the the um, uh, the, the uh, discussions about how expensive remote sensing was. Uh, we're trying to bring that cost down, and right now it's about a dollar per hectare. So this is a uh, quick little snapshot as to what things look like here. We have uh, over on the left the um, visual to near infrared image. Right in the middle here, we're, we're starting to explore the opportunities of thermal data. Right now, we have some some issues with thermal that I'll, I'm, I'm not going to get into uh, right now, but um, we are collecting thermal image. So the the, the idea between uh, or the the idea of collecting thermal imagery would then be to allow us to look at uh, subtle temperature changes in plants directly related to plant stress. And then uh, over to the right is a uh, LiDAR scan. And then if you look at these, these red boxes here, uh, over to the, um, the, the blow up here, this is what a three-dimensional uh, three veg structure would look like then. You can see around this little uh, edge here, we have a, a, a barn and uh, the, the canopy uh, based on, on height is, uh, as, as the uh, trees get taller, you get these uh, hotter colors. Over here to the far right, this is something that we are uh, just starting to come out with in, in terms of our, our uh, emerald ash borer work here. Uh, it, if you look close enough there, you can see some red dots, and we actually have some some uh, uh, canopies selected here. Um, basically, now that what you're looking at is this is the hyperspectral data snapped onto the LIDAR data. So now you're looking at, at the... Um, the complexity. So here you just have this this kind of LIDAR image. Here you have the LIDAR uh, and the hyperspectral image laid over top. When we did the Catskills work, one of the issues we had was it was just hyperspectral information. We were looking at pixels that were infested by hemlock woolly adelgid in 2001, and those areas improved significantly to what it would look like to be a fully recovered uh, stand of hemlock in the 2011-12 the uh, collect. Uh, really what we were looking at were striped maple forests or, or, or other uh, understory that had grown up and, and replaced these these dead hemlocks. So what we're trying to do with these these canopy models, the LIDAR data, to our hyperspectral data then is it allows us to get a good idea as to whether or not we're looking at the actual overstory that we intended to look at and then to remove out some of the understory noise. Uh, so a couple of the insects that we've looked at, hemlock woolly adelgid, it's a serious pest of eastern and Carolina hemlock. Uh, decline in mortality occurs uh, about four to ten years. We, we've seen in the, the northern extent, uh, so, so down in, in um, the, the southeast, we've seen trees die as, as quickly as, as a couple you know, to three years. Uh, up north, we tend to see a, a four to ten year uh, graduation of mortality. The New York study that we did, we, we did publish that in uh, this year in, in the Journal of Economic Entomology. Uh, if anybody wants the, the paper, feel free to email me. I'll send you a copy. But uh, it was a 10-year reassessment. So we, we took Avarice data, which is a, a, a NASA collection that occurred in, in 2001, and we uh, contracted out SPECTIR, which is a group out of uh, Reno, Nevada, to fly uh, hyperspectral imagery. And, and we did a 10-year a, a uh, change detection and, and showed that um, you know, unfortunately, the, the hemlock mortality was was definitely uh, significant in the, the Catskills region. Um, but with that, it was uh, it was great to to start a, uh, a relationship with the CRISP folks, and and uh, hopefully the the data that uh, we've made available is is starting to get used, and and hopefully we can find some utility in that with, uh, with some some uh, biocontrol releases or or uh, or, or other uh, strategies to to control. Uh, EAB is another one that everybody's been talking about. It, it sounds like you guys are, are quite active in pursuing funding to uh, to manage or mitigate for emerald ash borer. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, did somebody have a, a comment there? So, uh, uh, again, first ex discovered in, in southeast Michigan in, in 2002, and, and uh, you know, I had on this slide here 22 states and two provinces that might may have grown. I'm looking at the map here, and it looks like that's about where we're at here. Um, uh, but again, so EAB has been a, a, an issue that we're we're starting to look at and, and flew some some areas as well. So essentially, this is the process then of of how we go about doing that. We we uh, talk to the states and try and get some interesting targets. And if you look at the map here or, or this Google Earth image. Uh, you can see that um, we just put some some bounding areas, or what we call areas of interest, AOIs, 
uh, we put these AOIs out, and uh, within that we fly the imagery and, and, and scan to, uh, to develop these uh, species-specific stem maps. With that, we collect uh, data from, uh, we, we try to target about 100 trees per area to, to keep these, these areas are about two to three miles by eight miles in, in size. So we try and get at least 100 trees across the range. And then uh, with that, we collect species, diameter, discoloration, defoliation class, percent dieback, vigor, crown class, woodpecker evidence, uh, if it's an emerald ash borer tree. And then uh, again, if, it's an, if, if we're looking at ash, we'd look at epicormic branching. One of the things that we started to look at with uh, the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid project in 2011-12 in, uh, uh, was chlorophyll fluorescence. And uh, the chlorophyll fluorescence data we've been collecting uh, since then. And, and uh, we started to look at just foliar uh, fluorescence. Uh, but I've, I've been recently talking to uh, uh, Dr. Johnson at uh, University of Melbourne in Australia. And uh, we're starting to look at things like uh, bark fluorescence as well uh, for some of these wood boring insects. Uh, just to, to look at, again, kind of that holy grail of, of trying to find uh, the earliest possible detection as possible. Uh, al along with the, the uh, fluorescence, we're also looking at can canopy transparency, and that's just using a, a digital SLR and taking uh, images straight up into the canopy and looking at um, uh, transparency. And then sp uh, spectrometer calibration, calibrating the, uh, the, the uh, G light from the air with handheld and, and uh, uh, handheld spectrometers on the ground, and then a tarp flyover where we put some some information together. Some of the ground methods again, uh, just to to give you a visual of these. If you look at the um, the image up top, that's a hemlock in the Catskills, and you can see that that hemlock is. Uh, if if you start to think about transparency, that the the fade on that tree is is pretty great, and uh, that is. Uh, uh, definitely not a, a healthy tree. Down in the bottom there, you can see a, a bunch of infested ash along a uh, road corridor. Uh, I believe that that image was actually taken. Somebody mentioned Route 28 today. That, that's probably down from that area as well. Um, so here we, we look at vigor, and vigor is measured on a, a percent. Uh, using a, a um, numerical classification, we break it up into uh, one through five, uh, one being less than 10% dieback, moving up to five being a dead tree. Discoloration, uh, again, we put it on a, a ranked scale, zero, no trace of discoloration, three, uh, greater than 60% discoloration. Excuse me. Now, uh, back to the fluorescence then. So uh, looking at chlorophyll fluorescence, you can see the image on, on the, uh, the top left there. That would be uh, a, a visual of, of what's going on as we, uh, we, we dark adapt these, these leaves. So we, we take the leaves. Um, Put them in a condition where they're they're removed from light for approximately 30 30 uh, minutes or so. It, it makes the the leaves then essentially respond as if uh, it had been dark, so that you know at uh, uh, nighttime to, to morning. So we get that uh, early morning fluorescence condition, the, the the truest fluorescence condition that we can get. And uh, really uh, physiologically, we're looking at a reduction in net, uh, net photosynthesis as one of the earliest and most subtle signs of plant stress. So um, there are a lot of different things that we look at from fluorescence, and, and really what we're trying to, to look at is um, you know, water stress, uh, heat stress, uh, chemical stress, uh, insect stress, that they all create this, this, uh, this damage to uh, photosynthetic tissue. So we're trying to, to get a, a, a kind of a digital fingerprint on, on these, these damage uh, agents and, and, and try and relate that to, to what we're doing uh, with our image acquisitions. Photosynthetic uh, capacity is directly measured as fluorescence, um, and that's been shown uh, by a lot of other folks as well. With the canopy transparency, we're looking at these, uh, again, photos taken straight up into the canopy. Uh, what we're using then is we have a, a, a soft, uh, software package that's publicly available for free. You can download it. It's called uh, Gaplight Analyzer. Um, this has been uh, software that was uh, developed to, to look at um, uh, tissue recovery in, in uh, uh, medical fields. So uh, we use it to then essentially um, turn the light uh, image into a, a dark uh, or black pixel, white pixel, light, dark, and uh, develop a um, uh, a method to um, develop a, a per, or extract a percentage out of the images uh, automatically, so we, we can automate this process. Uh, take all of the images that we throw into it with a, um, a tag 
per tree, and then come up with a, a, a percent canopy uh, transparency for the uh, for the trees. Let me go back here. So we take all of this information then and we, we dump it into a database. And from the database, we have all uh, of, of each uh, category. Then uh, we, we rank them into one uh, uniform Z-score. So it's a, a, the, the Z-score then is, is a lot what allows us to look at a tree and, and determine whether or not these trees are, are healthy or unhealthy. And then we can categorize them into uh, 10 different categories of, of health. Image acquisition, we always expect the unexpected. I, I mentioned earlier that, um, you know, here's the in the, the uh, center, the, the G light looking down, you have the LIDAR on the left, and then you have the hyperspectral and thermal camera on the, uh, the, the uh, right top and, and bottom, respectively. Uh, down in the bottom left of this uh, picture here, that's that uh, downwelling irradiance uh, sensor that I was talking about. Um, Often the, the distance there, you see a lot of clouds, and, and one of the things that you need to, to look at when you see the clouds is if you look down, you see that there are shadows. So uh, that can be an issue as we, we start to, to measure some of these um, some of these areas, especially an area like the Catskills, where, where terrain definitely creates weather, and, and uh, it's, it's hard to get a cloud-free day down there. When we did the uh, image acquisition in, in 2011-12, it took us about three weeks to get the information uh, across the area just to get uh, cloud-free coverage as best as we could. So that period from, from uh, day one to day 21, uh, there's a lot that, that happens uh, over the, the you know, physiological growing season. So it's, it's something that we, we really try and reduce as much as possible. Up in the top left, that's a, a GPS that we use for the, uh, for the pilot to, to lock in lines. Um, inherently things go wrong and, and we had some issues where we had to uh, hot swap these uh, in air so we're, we're trying to remove them and, and put um, uh, put the lines into a new unit and, and get it onto the, the yoke as quick as we could. Uh, computers crash uh, and, and uh, really just about anything can, can happen so we're trying to reduce that uh, as best as we can and, and come up with a, a pretty streamlined process. Uh, that's the air, and now uh, into the ground we're doing the same thing. We're trying to streamline the process and, and automate things. When you have issues like clouds, shadows, moisture, uh, you have all sorts of, of um, potential differences. I also mentioned day one to day 21, uh, physiologically a lot changes. Uh, you also get a, a automatically you get this this striping. If you look at the images to the uh, to the right, you have uh, you can see the lines, and the lines are essentially the the uh, the image acquisition areas, the the, the uh, collection zone. So as you know, I mentioned in the very beginning, a, a push room going across the land landscape. These are the, uh, each of these uh, these sweeps essentially these these lines. Uh, and then down in the bottom right, after we run through this uh, brightness correction algorithm and, and uh, try and run some spectral unmixing and, and uh, develop our, our species maps. We're trying to reduce that striping as best we can. Um, and I'm, I'm going to show you really what the difference looks like. Here's the Catskills image. This is just the, uh, the Spectre Collect where we, we just had hyperspectral imagery. So if, if you look at that um, noise reduction it, it it took place, but there was still there was still quite a bit of noise in in that that image. So we we had a, some some heavy striping that we we continued. It took us quite a while to to uh, to get through. And then here is a uh, uh, an image where we have lidar and hyperspectral imagery together. You can still see striping, but for the most part, things lined up. It is a black and white image. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to do that to, to confuse things. I'll show you the color image in a, in a minute here. But uh, just looking at striping and that, that wave pattern, we, we were able to get rid of that. And now, coming out of the plane, we're able to produce this a lot faster than we used to be able to produce. So the, the, the return time in, in post-processing, we're, we're trying to streamline that as fast as possible as, as uh, we did with the, uh, the aerial collects. So this is really uh, now where we're at. Looking at the uh, LIDAR and hyperspectral image put together, you can see that uh, we're able to do some, some uh, stem mapping. And, and here you know, we, uh, we have on the left, we have some, some nice big crowns that we're able to, to develop species mapping. Down here on the right, though, I, I wanted to point this out, where we have some edge, we also have some, some ground shadowing occurring from the trees. Uh, that creates a little bit of noise and a little bit of difficulty in, in looking at pure crowns. So we try and avoid our, our species mapping and our, our stem mapping uh, using these, these edge trees. So we try and pick either nice open grown crowns or crowns in a forested area that we can, we can pull without much shading. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So here's a, an example of that. So we have both a, um, a, a forested area and an urban area kind of mixed together. And uh, we're able then to um, extract the spectral information using the red edge index uh, and the g light canopy height. So we're able to take the, the, the LIDAR information, the canopy heights, pull out the understory, remove that understory noise, and then use um, the hyperspectral data to extract the spectral information uh, using a, uh, a red edge index, which is uh, taking the uh, near infrared and, and, and red bands and, and, uh, and developing our models that way. That also allows us then the, the red edge, uh, excuse me, red edge, uh, and, and some other vegetation indices allow us to look at trees in decline from from uh, from the imagery. <laughs> excuse me. Now, so uh, taking that image and then decomposing it a little further, uh, this would then look at just the ash uh, in the area if, if we're looking at emerald ash borer. And here you can see uh, a range of ash from healthy, uh, very healthy to uh, moderate decline, non-ash species, and then ash in severe decline. So we're able then to, to rank them and, and start to extract some of this information uh, that then becomes uh, more usable to, uh, to folks on the ground. Uh, here we had some, uh, basically taking the information that we had, this is some, some data that we flew in New Hampshire where we had uh, field validation. Uh, we had some direct EAB confirmations. These were, were new towns that we were able to confirm uh, just from the, the images that we collected and, and uh, some of that decomposition that I was just talking about. Uh, went down, felled a couple of these trees, and uh, pulled up uh, EAB, and uh, they were some new detects. Uh, that one of the, the folks in that picture there was the, the landowner, and he, uh, he said he actually remembered when we were flying and, and was kind of blown away that we were able to come to his house from the, the data that we collected from the air. So it was a kind of a neat success story. One of the things that we also found as we went out and did some of the ground collections, uh, we started to find ash that was cut up and it was just loaded with, uh, with the EAB gallery. So uh, we also found quite a bit of woodpeckering, but it was, it was interesting to find a, a, a lot of these trees had already been felled. So again, how we say early is, is sort of relative that you know these these trees had already been in decline and, and already been uh, a couple of the dead ones had already been cut down that looked like they had already been uh, pretty well infested so uh, not quite as early as we'd hoped but uh, still kind of an interesting uh, interesting area where we had a new detection for the town and with that I'd like to just thank uh, we had quite a bit of assistance from from New Hampshire Massachusetts uh, uh, this is the, the last couple of years here that the Forest Service group that uh, aviation folks that I was talking about, University of Vermont uh, and, and Rutgers as well. Um, and with that, I'm, I'm, I, if I have time, I'm happy to open up to some questions.